Vaccine, quarantine and Victoria's latest lockdown. Is this the wake-up call we needed? Welcome to Q&A. What a wonderful welcome. Thank you so much for that. I'm Stan Grant. It's fantastic to be with you here live from the Illawarra Performing Arts Centre in Wollongong. Like many coastal areas, this region is experiencing a population boom brought on by COVID. We'll be talking about that. Joining me on the panel, the Mayor of Wollongong, Gordon Bradbury. Business Executive, Diane Smith-Gander. Labor MP for Whitlam, Stephen Jones. Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of Sydney, Lisa jackson Porver and Liberal MP for Goldstar, Tim Wilson. Please make them all feel welcome. <laughs> now, of course, you can stream us live on iView and, of course, all the socials as well. Quanda, if you didn't know it, is the hashtag. Please get involved in the conversation. Our first question comes from Simon Barnhill. I'm pleased to hear the announcement today that the government will support a purpose-built quarantine facility proposed by the Victorian government. Will the federal government now build a facility in every state and shift away from using hotels in highly populated cities, which would have helped avoid this two-week lockdown in Victoria and prevent future statewide lockdowns around Australia, while also providing more capacity for returning Australians? Tim Wilson, this has just been announced um, today. We're really looking for a bit of clarity on this. There is an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, with the federal government and Victoria, but not a lot of meat on the bone yet. Who's going to pay for this? About $200 million, I think, for the facility. Is the federal government going to, to meet the cost of that? Well, obviously, it's going to be a facility that's shared between the state and the Commonwealth. I don't know the, the fundamental details of what, who's paying what dollars and what cents. Uh, but there's a focus on making sure that we have the facilities we need to make sure we can have returning Australians come back through quarantine. And it won't be in addition... It won't be um, at the expense of hotel quarantine. It will be in addition to, as well as in addition to, the Howard Springs facility that's been doubled because Australia needs hotel quarantine for so long as this pandemic is going to operate. It needs additional quarantine sites as well to take the volume and the load. It's not going to be a simple substitute. And there's many reasons why this is. A lot of people think it's easy to just look at it from a facilities point of view, but it's a big logistics exercise. You need uh, mm. airports, close airports, you need close hospitals, you need a workforce. And that's one of the critical reasons why we've been using urban centres is because that's where a workforce is, not just in terms of catering, nursing, <coughs> health workers and the like. And all of those things are going to be needed. So the site that's been selected, I understand, for Victoria near Avalon Airport mm. meets a lot of those tests and thresholds so that people can get the care and support they need uh, regardless of their circumstances. You know, I could hear a bit of frustration um, in Simon's question. It's a frustration that we hear a lot that this has not been done sooner. And even Jane Holt, and the, the government's point person on this, has expressed exactly that, that disappointment and frustration. Why has it taken this long? Well, well firstly, we doubled the size of the Howard Springs facility consistent with what... Jane Holton outlined. One of her frustrations is that in some of the centres across the country run by the states that not all of the standards that she's recommended have been fully implemented. And, you know, I, I share that frustration, mm. but uh, this is going to be a package between Howard Springs Hotel Quarantine and the new facility because it's not just about the, the, the challenge we have in returning Australians, about making sure they go through that quarantine process. But we shouldn't blind ourselves to some simple realities. Wherever there is human-to-human -human interaction with this virus, we have seen a spread. And um, those risks remain because even if you locate it out in the middle of nowhere, the workforce still has to go to that location. They still have to interact. They still have to be served food. They still have to get health mm. tests and the like. So it's only the maximum we can do to protect people and to stop the transmission of the virus and the circumstances. Stephen Jones, you must be pleased with this. This is what <clears throat> you've been calling for, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, quarantine is federal responsibility. Section 51, it's in the Constitution in black and white. The Commonwealth Government has been ducking responsibility for it for over 12 months now. I make no criticism about hotel quarantine as a stopgap measure. It was the right thing to do up front when we were moving quickly. We needed a facility. There were no tourists coming in. 
There are lots of empty hotels, made a lot of sense to use them, as Tim says, near capital cities, near available workforces. But as time moved on, it was pretty clear that we weren't just going to be doing this for a few months. We're going to do, be doing it for a long period of time. And the hotels are designed for tourists, not as health facilities and not as biosecurity facilities. So I think it's beyond obvious now that we need specialist built facilities, at least in every capital city. I agree with Tim, near the international airports, um, as close as possible to the international airports. Uh, but I think once we see these facilities being stood up, I don't think there'll be a lot of state premiers around the country saying, uh, any state leaders of any political stripe saying, you know, we'd rather they were in hotel quarantine yeah. rather than these purpose-built facilities. They will be the mainstay. Quarantine is on a lot of your minds here tonight, and that's also the thing of our next question from Carly Clegg. Uh, hi, Stan and panel. Uh, I'm from the South Coast. With the recent scare, scare in our area and the current outbreak in Melbourne, should this be a wake-up call to our government that we need to start moving the vaccines out quicker? Do we need to look at having multiple COVID vaccine hubs in regional and country areas? I might go to you, Gordon Bradbury, on, on this. Um, the experience here in Wollongong, more broadly in the South Coast, regional areas, in getting the vaccine and questions about quarantine, what more can be done? Well, from my perspective, anyway, I, I just it seems a very clunky exercise. I, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to it at times, and uh, it depends on which part of Australia you're from. But when we had the situation down here where we had uh, the possible uh, spread of infection here, the community did respond pretty fast, and uh, the local hospital became a focal point as well as setting up other uh, testing centres. <coughs> so it is, is possible to act fast... But when it comes to the vaccination, that's another story because uh, we haven't handled the issues of the so-called clotting factors that influence the AstraZeneca uh, rollout. Uh, then, of course, uh, the Pfizer is the, the uh, held up as the ideal, but at the same time, it, the messaging around it hasn't helped. And with respect to our po political leaders, I think we've blurred scientific and medical advice and then we also had the political advice somewhat intermingled and I think it should have been separated. It should have been done more clearly with the scientific medical advisors doing the front work and being the, the messages, uh, messages of, the, of how it was to be administered. It, it seems to me that it's created a lot of confusion. The only thing that saved us is basically, as far as I'm concerned, is that is we've put a borders up and we've been really strict in terms of managing outbreaks, and that's mm. saved us. It isn't. And the other thing that is concerning me is the fact, unless we get our populations vaccinated, then there's an opportunity for variants to uh, pop up. And not only that, that period between the first and second vaccines needs to be really strictly managed, and that's concerning me as well. And then, of course, those with disabilities, aged care facilities and so on, it doesn't seem to have a coherence about it that builds confidence in the community. Lisa jackson um, as well as your position uh, at Sydney University, you're also an epidemiologist. Yep. When we look at, at vaccine, um, we're always told the vaccine was the magic bullet, wasn't it? That gets us to the other side, that gets us to a COVID normal. Gordon has just outlined some of the frustrations. I know that people in the room here are frustrated and confused about this as well. But do you think we're getting some momentum now? I think we're understanding as an Australian community that COVID is here and that we can't be complacent. We've seen what's happened overseas. Um, there's very few people who may have connections overseas that wouldn't have stories of someone who's passed away or someone who's been diabolically mm. unwell. We've been very, very fortunate. We've missed it. Um, what we are looking at very closely and what I think we should be doing better is applying the lessons that we've learnt over the last 12 months. There's been exquisite, priceless learnings that I think are being missed, you know, that we have got a COVID vaccine rollout that's got a few hiccups those hiccups are going to be very, very difficult to retract from unless we learn straight away. Things like going into aged care facilities and not having 100% of the people there uh, vaccinated within the time frame of the two vaccination shots. 
Um, and that means the staff, that means the, the frontline staff, the nursing staff, the carers, the cooks, the cleaners, the drivers, the bus people. It has to be the whole kit and caboodle. And it can't be this ad hoc process where, oh, great, we've got some leftover vaccines, let's get them in the arms of health workers who may not have a mm. second vaccine booked. Because the thing works and the efficacy of the vaccine is based on two shots, not one. So this whole story has to be a little bit better coordinated um, and I think we need to get very serious about it. Winter is here. Can I just ask, if, if you don't mind, could I have a show of hands, how many people in the room have not had the vaccine, fully vaccinated, have not had? Wow. And, and have, have had, hands down, one, two, three, four, maybe... Maybe half a Just dozen, or a bit, or a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we know that there are, you know, there are circumstances here. There are different rollouts. There are different age groups. There are different vaccines. But uh, Tim Wilson, does it raise the question about a need for some incentive? We've seen this in other parts of the world. The United States is even running a lottery and get a million bucks if you get your vaccine. Um, is, is, is there a need for a um, for, for some more incentive? I'm not convinced that there's more incentive for individuals. I suspect that the people who haven't had their hands up before saying they haven't got it, uh, the overwhelming majority would be encouraged to get it and would be happy to get it, not just to take care of themselves, um, but their sense of responsibility towards others. Um, and that's something that's obviously a very live conversation mm. uh, in Victoria right now. But, you know, I think there are ways you could establish incentives with some of the providers to deliver um, uh, vaccine rollouts probably a bit more efficiently so that they meet benchmarks um, to make it attractive. But I think for most people who want to do the right thing and want to be vaccinated so we can return to a COVID normal, I'm not sure that a, an incentive is going to do much. The only concern I have is there is this not, not an insignificant section of the population who are vaccine hesitant. And uh, there's a number of factors that play into it, from uh, particularly mm. the concern around uh, unintended consequences um, with uh, with the particularly associated with the AstraZeneca mm. um, and the side effects uh, uh, around AstraZeneca and so but I don't think an incentive is going to get over that I think it's about building a sense of confidence in these vaccines and that where there are side effects they can be addressed and that's the role of epidemiologists nurses and doctors to consult with their patients if they do have hesitancy but as someone who has got one of the vaccines um, I can only encourage people to do so are people in the room concerned? Hesitant? Concerned? Hesitant? No, no, no. That, yeah, yeah, there's some. Yeah, yeah. That, it's a mixed bag. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it is a mixed bag. I and think Diana, I'm, I'm, changed I'm though a little bit. There's huh? not as much hesitancy as there was before. I think Victoria has taught anyone who was hesitant that they, we can't be hesitant. Well, we've there's seen, we've so seen, much we've seen a spike, haven't we? Now. We've but seen a spike in vaccines after the. Exactly. Can, can I go and to we've you? We've been told that there's a supply problem. And so, you know, across Australia, people are thinking, mm. well, people in aged care haven't had it yet. My mother only had her first jab on the 26th of May just last week. I got mine earlier, my brother, um, you know, a month before, two months before. So we've been told there's a supply problem and so we're doing that family hold back thing. It's not my turn yet. I think we really need some very consistent and unified communication. What I think Australians want is our leaders to stand up and give us some clear communication. And forget about whether... <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Let's forget about whether it's the federal government mm. or the Labor government, the Liberal here, the state, this and that and the other. We should just be very clear that our best defence is a vaccine rollout and the next best thing is our quarantine and how are we going to move mm. towards that? And Simon, you are so right. It should be everywhere. We should be aspiring to get out of hotel quarantine entirely. But we need to frame this properly so that people will understand, I think Australians are smart, they'll understand the messages, they'll go out and get the vaccine. Stephen Jones, I'm just wondering why we don't hear definitively that once we get to... X percentage of the population, 75, 80, I don't know what the percentage would be. Once we get to that percentage of the population with the full vaccination, once we have the quarantine, we can make a, a definitive promise that there'll be no more lockdown, that the borders will be open, that we'll be living with COVID rather than trying to 
to shut ourselves down and avoid any COVID, which in a world where it is going to be around for a long time would be impossible. Yeah, look, I think getting back to your original question, should we put in, should we have incentives on the table? I think the best incentive is keeping yourself, your family and your neighbours safe. Correct. Keeping our hospital wards empty, mm. uh, ensuring that as a community we can return to normal. I wouldn't rule out some of the things you're talking about down the track, but frankly, the biggest issue we have at the moment is supply and getting the supply chain sorted. I imagine there'll be plenty of people in the audience who've rung up for their jab and been told maybe a week, maybe two weeks, maybe a month. It's a lot of nodding. Or you're, you're, not in, you're not in the category. I'm sorry, you don't fit a category. Or which, or which one you can or get. Which one, yeah, and I actually want to, to the point that a couple of people, we've got two, two good vaccines that are available. Yeah. They're both safe. They're both world-class vaccines um, and I think it's incumbent on people like me and Tim and other community leaders to be instilling confidence in the community mm -hmm. based on the medical evidence that is available. The other thing we can do to instill confidence is to ensure that if we're telling everyone to go out and get the jab that the government's done its bit by ensuring the su supply chain is made available, I'd have done it differently. Um, I'd have had more mass vaccination hubs and I'd have had the closest max 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 mass vaccination <laughs> hub, I'll get there eventually, <laughs> to Wollongong is Sydney, um, where the third biggest city in New South Wales, you've got to travel two hours mm. to get to the closest hub. So I'd have put them in large regional areas. I probably would have worked more closely with the New South Wales and the state governments who do vaccination programs every day of the week and use the GP network as a backstop, not a mm. main stop. Mm. Um, and then I think we've also got a role as leaders, as I said, to ensure that we're running the PR campaigns and ensuring that the things that we say are adding to confidence, not detracting mm. from it. Could I just throw in yeah. another, another bit that really did concern me? And suddenly when we had the first case of a negative reaction to a AstraZeneca, it suddenly was headlines. And, and as, uh, it was not put into context. And trying to get the statistical message across to the Australian community that this was an aberration and a statistical aberration of, of a, a level that didn't warrant the amount of media attention that was focused upon... That, that, that's, that's what caused... That, can I just finish? That's what caused the problem. And, and I really think that we've, we need to tidy up the messaging about how we handle this pandemic and also especially the rollout of the uh, vaccinations. Mm. But using those statistical aberrations, the way the media highlighted that and, and in such a way as just instilled fear in people, I've got a greater chance of being eaten by a shark off Wollongong Beach than I have dying of COVID, <laughs> as, as COVID vaccination. <laughs> This, uh, this, this question of, of vaccinations is certainly exercising a lot of your minds. Our next question comes from Fiona Myers. I'm a mother and full-time carer for two of my children living with disabilities. They're both NDIS participants and we have paid carers in our home every single day. There's been no urgency or duty of care from our government to protect people with disabilities from COVID-19. Our aged and disabled populations are still not all protected with vaccines. The workers who work with them are not vaccinated. And sadly, our government has no accurate figures on the vaccine rollout in the disabled population. Why have people with disabilities been an afterthought in the vaccine vaccination process, despite being prioritised in the rollout plan? Mm. Yeah. Tim. <laughs> Tim Wilson, this is... Um... This is the burden of government that a lot of these questions are, are falling sure. to you here tonight. But can, can I just add something to that in terms of numbers? And this, this surprised me, I have to say. At Senate estimates just this week, for people living in disability care, just 355, or about 1.6% of more than 22,000 residents have received both doses. How can that happen? Well, as, as everyone's aware, there's stages to the vaccine rollout based on the degree of need and the risk of what would happen. Shouldn't this Should be a priority, though? Well, well, I, mean, I understand there's stages, but you're hearing here from someone who's absolutely connected to this. Mm. It's, it's, it's not a question of stages, it's a question of priority, isn't it? 
Well, that, it is a question of priorities and the people who get the priority first and have got the priority first are those most at risk of very severe health conditions if they attract COVID-19. People's disabilities don't automatically equate to that challenge. And there are young people who have a higher risk in comparison to some older people in other sections of the population. The best opportunity or the best outcome that everybody would like, I suspect, on this panel and for the, for the most part in the audience here is to be vaccinated yesterday. But when we have to provide supply over a time frame that actually makes sure we target different sections of the population based on their risk profile, it will move progressively. And as we move through different stages, we start net the next different stage and continue to go down. Because of course, a lot of the younger people in the room, because of their risk or diminished or low risk profile, won't have been vaccinated. So it's a stage rollout um, and people with a disability are a critical part of that conversation. Um, but there are other subsections of the population with a higher risk profile that get a more urgent... Fiona, can I just go back to Fiona for a moment? <laughs> then, then, then I'll come yeah, to you, Diane. Thanks. Fiona, you were shaking your head about that. What does that answer say to you? Well, my understanding is that people with disability were in phase 1B of the rollout mm. and residential care was included in that, as well as disability carers working in private homes. So I... all of my carers should have been vaccinated by now. I'm the only one who has been. And... and... As outlined before, we've had we've had some supply issues into Australia. No one's disputing that. That's been very public. Um, but we don't wait for one stage to finish to start the next one because if we did, it would take even longer for them to be able to access supply, and it would be take even longer for those in different subsections of the population. So the objective is to get people vaccinate, vaccinated as quickly as possible, and to make sure that this period ends as quickly as possible. I just don't agree. Diane. It's very hard for us to take an answer like that seriously. Lisa said we need to get serious about. <laughs> And I'm sorry, I, I, I am usually not the critical person. I'm usually the measured lady with the grey hair. But as I said, my mother in aged care received her vaccine on the 26th of May and fully two months before that, my 30-something Pilates instructor received her vaccine as a frontline health worker and that circle doesn't square to me. And I think we all have experiences like this which make us think that the best minds are not being put to the issue of getting this roll out back up the S-curve. Because as a business person, I know that take-up will follow an S-curve if you work hard at it. And we're bumping along the bottom. We need to change the way we're dealing with this to absolutely accelerate our rates of vaccine. Otherwise, at the end of next year, we'll still be waiting. Well, there was actually took 45 days to issue the first million doses. It's now in the tens to issue the fourth. So we're continuing to move through rapidly. And you're 100% right, it's going on a curve and it's getting yeah, much faster. But we faster. need it to go like this, well, not like that. As I said at the start, the best day we could have everybody vaccinated was yesterday. But we're going to keep working at it to make sure that's the case. But if we wait for one stage to be finished before we start the next stage, then that will be going for many, many years versus getting every single bit of it moving as quickly as possible. I still want my mum done before the Pilates instructor. Sorry. Well, <laughs> and, I, and I want people with disabilities who should we have all been want people done. With disabilities. Who should have been done. <laughs> and if it was just people with disabilities, you'd say this is a stuff up. Um, how are we going to fix it? Mm -hmm. But it's not just people with disabilities. It's aged care. Yep. It's people with disabilities, it's frontline health workers, it's frontline workers right across the economy. All the people who we've been lectured to to get out from under the doona, um, the thing that's going to get us out from under the doona is getting the vaccine supply and all the logistics sorted. The one thing the Commonwealth said, we've got this, we're going to do it, is the one thing that they've stuffed up. Can, can I, I just say, though, that's, you know, of course in opposition you get to, to raise those questions, but an extraordinary time to be in government isn't it, to deal with a, a once in a hundred years sure. pandemic such as this. Mm -hmm. And while we talk about the things that are going wrong, we're in this room here tonight having this mm -hmm. conversation. Australia has been spared, mm -hmm. thankfully, the worst of this. And now we're getting to the stage where we can see potentially beyond this. There have been some achievements, haven't there? Yeah, and I absolutely, you might have heard me earlier saying hotel quarantine was actually a sensible solution when you're running at a million miles an hour trying to sort out a problem 
and you can't start building quarantine centres and have them stood up in, in a week's time. So I'm not criticising everything, but the one thing the Commonwealth said, we've got this, this is our responsibility, get out of the way, states, we're going to do that, was the vaccine rollout. And it's the one thing they should have said, well, who, roll, who runs vaccine programs in this country? You know, week in, week out, year in, year out, states do it and they do it damn well. Let's work with them more closely. Let's use their infrastructure. Yes, GPs have a role. They should have been the backstop, not the front stop. And we absolutely should be getting into those at-risk populations, our friends, our community, in aged care, in disability services, in group homes, and ensuring that they were absolutely at the front of the queue. And it's a disgrace that they haven't been. But, Stephen, if you're going to judge everything against... <laughs> Stephen, if you're going to judge everything against perfection, right now we have a breakout. No, I'm not, I'm not doing well, that. Well, politely you are. If you go and look at the Victorian circumstance, right now we have an outbreak and frontline health workers, ambulance officers in Victoria, only half of them have been vaccinated by the state government. It is going to take time. It, people will always find that frustrating as an answer. I completely understand why, because we want people to be vaccinated. But I'm not going to sit here and lecture the Victorian government and say they have failed every step of the way because frontline health workers, including sometimes people who go out and pick up people who may be suffering very serious conditions associated with COVID-19, have failed. It's about building confidence, as we've discussed before, encouraging people to do it, providing the pathway for people to be able to, because the objective, again, of everybody on this panel, and I would hope of the Australian population, is to get the nation vaccinated as quickly as possible. Perfection's not the standard. Doing what you said and promised you were going to do okay. is the standard, and I think that's a reasonable standard to hold you to. OK, we have to move on to our, our next question. This one comes from Paul Boltwood. Good evening, panel. Small and medium-sized businesses employ the majority of workers around Australia. Many of these businesses, including tour operators, are shutting their doors for good due to border closures, lockdowns and the demise of JobKeeper. Their staff are destined to join the ranks of the silent unemployed, especially those over 50 or those whose partners work part-time. Is it time to introduce JobKeeper too? Paul had specifically asked before we came on here, Gordon, that he wanted to direct a question to you. So how are you seeing this, <laughs> this impact? How are you seeing this impact here where, where you are? Well, just remember, I'm a lowly Lord Mayor, OK? <laughs> uh, the, uh, the federal representatives here uh, would uh, no doubt have uh, something to say about this one. But at the same time, yeah, I'm very conscious of the fact that uh, small and medium-sized businesses employ most of the people in this country and they're a great source of uh, employment opportunities and the impact upon them has been immense. Uh, the government has announced today the $500 uh, the, uh, uh, payment, the disaster payment, but I think that's the term that's being applied for uh, those who have been out of... Uh, job for more than a week, as in Victoria. It's five, five, 500 the, for full time, about 300 or so for people working part time, and there are right. some other there are conditions. There are no other conditions yeah. around it, uh, and yeah. inevitably, uh, and, and just from my observations anyway, and Stephen and uh, Tim might want to comment on this one. It is uh, that the government, I think, has uh, just tried to do uh, throw money at the problem. Uh, the challenges are before us. You, you've got to think fast in, in dealing with a pandemic. Uh, it's not only about vaccinations, it's about or testing and all that. How do we keep people employed? How do we keep people sustained? And it m might, be, might be the case that we've got to think of uh, this as another means by which we sustain the Australian workforce and population uh, for a, another period of time while we get through these difficulties. But it's a bit like all the factors involved in the pandemic. It requires decisions to, decisions that have uh, had to be made fast. And I don't know uh, how we're going to pay for it at the other end. That's the other issue. Mm. We can, um, yeah, pour money into it. But what I am concerned about is ultimately the issue of inflation. Uh, D Diane smith as mm. someone who works in, in the business sector, and one of the things that we needed to do um, with respect to what Gordon had to say is throw money at it. Um, job keeper and job seeker, getting people to the other side. We're now out of that, but what does the future look like? We're in a really interesting labour mm. market at the moment. You know, SEEK had its single biggest month in April in the 23 years that it's been in existence. But at the same time, we have 250,000 Australians who are in long-term unemployment. 
So 290,000 jobs on seek, 250,000 people in long-term unemployment and real changes occurring. I think in a few years' time when we look back at this, we'll see that COVID accelerated us into a very different sort of work for Australians. Um, I'm really interested in this uh, emergency payment. Mm. One of the conditions um, that I've read about is that you need to be in a federal agreed hotspot. Mm. Now, we don't have hotspot um, management uniformly across Australia. And so I wonder whether there's a little nudge in there to try to get us to a more uniform approach uh, to have hotspots and keep our Tim, borders Tim a bit Wilson more open. Tim Wilson might be able to answer that. He might be able to tell us about that if he's still talking to me. Um, I'm sure But I'm I sure do he think is. there are some Respectful sectors, <laughs> you know, like, like Paul's sector in tourism, where it's a very tricky thing because we did see some people choose to really leave that sector. You know, we know that the work is often, you know, socially difficult hours... Um, the pay's not that high. And I think we may have seen some people move out of that sort of work. And there's a bit of a concern that if we provide more job keeper type support, the people may wander out yonder. You know, they'll turn up for their domestic tourism, but there'll be no collateral support and services. But I can hear Paul saying, yeah, but if you've got no money to pay the people, I definitely won't have anything for them to do when they turn up. So it's a very yeah. Difficult just just on, on that question of a of federally designated hotspots, and I think another thing is a follow-up to that as well. Another one of the conditions is you can get this access to this, this disaster relief as long as you don't ha have any more than $10,000 in liquid assets. So people may have to go and cash their shares um, before they, they are able to receive any support from the government as well, or if they other, have other things that they could actually turn to liquid assets. So just clarify that, that question around federally designated hotspots. Is that is what Diane was saying, where you're heading on this? Well, I'm not the Prime no, Minister no, no. or the Treasurer last I checked, but um, the point of the hotspots is to actually contain some discussion around how far the money is provided. If people are in need, then the money is provided support. But the Commonwealth Government's position has been consistent that they've wanted a federally agreed to, between the states and Commonwealth, through the National Cabinet process, an identification of the hotspots. There have been some states that have disagreed with that approach. So we've always wanted that. Um, and so by clarifying in terms of at least the base in which you're providing funding, then will it at least send a de facto message? I've no doubt it will. Um, so, uh, so I do think there is that um, outcome associated with it. When it comes to the $10,000 liquid assets, uh, at the start, or the proposition is that we encourage, obviously, individuals to take care of themselves, and if they have significant cash reserves um, in different ways, whether it's they hold it in shares or some other asset, uh, then if the liquid asset, then you know the expectation is that people support themselves, but we will support people when they need assistance. Mm. Our next question comes from Kevin Yong. Kevin, hi, Stan and panel. Have a good evening. Management of COVID-19 has posed serious challenges to several parts of our economy. After so many months, has the university sector collectively considered new and relevant strategies to face the future? We cannot continue to depend on the cash cow of international students. Thank you. Lisa Jackson pulled, but there was a there was a lot of hay to be made for a long time in international students. Is is that over, and was there too much of a dependency on international students? Yeah, look, it's a it's a great question. Thank you very much for that. And you know, we concern ourselves a lot about how we're going to continue to be world class education leaders, contribute to world class research, continue our exquisite relationships with industry translate all of the stuff we do uh, into practical things that we use today, whether they're cochlear implants or Wi-Fi. I mean, there's just been extraordinary innovation. Um, in the 1990s, the funding model was very much around for Australia's public universities, uh, was funded through the public purse. Uh, and that was, you know, quite... Uh, important because, you know, it was really about offering people quality education, um, the Australian education system, the tertiary education system, started in the mid-1800s where the people of Australia really didn't want to keep sending their children to England or to places abroad. The 
university sector in this land came out of the geography and the express need of the Australian people. So the sector is absolutely from us, for us, by us. And so since the 1990s, there has been a change to the funding model as government funding has decreased. And it's gotten to the point now where there's very little funding that is coming from the public purse and the government worked closely with the universities on the new funding model uh, that was in part about international students. Um, international students have been enjoying the pleasures of uh, coming to Australia and we have enjoyed the pleasures of educating international people and that is a, a fabulous way of expressing um, our um, soft power, if you like, on an international stage when people go away with an Australian education uh, and many of those people, of course, become absolutely mm. fantastic in their own nations. Some return to stay here and make a home here um, in the same way that we also send a smaller number of students overseas for mm. education. It is an international sector. It's not something uh, that we can confine the, and quarantine there, and just say our a, sector is for Australian students only. Th there is a question, though, of over-reliance, which is Kevin's yeah. question. And Indeed. If, if you look Indeed. at the numbers... Um, 956,000 uh, international students, almost a million international students in 2019. The majority of those um, from China. So clearly, there was a lot of money to be made, 37 billion to Australia's economy in the 2018-19 financial year, um, up from 32 billion the previous financial year. Patricia Davidson is here um, in our audience tonight. She's the new vice chancellor of the University of Wollongong. And Patricia, you're coming into this um, position at a, at a hard time, like a lot of other universities. The University of Wollongong has taken a big hit as well. What does the future look like for you? Well, uh, we're optimistic. Um, I think there's been a lot of pivoting. We've put a lot more attention into the domestic market. We didn't have as high a dependency on international students as other sectors. And also we're looking at other approaches to leverage the internationalisation that Lisa identified as being so important in different models that are more hybrid models. But certainly we're really optimistic that hopefully soon there'll be some pilot programs to be able to get um, international students back. What, what, what sort of programs do you have in mind? Well, I think uh, what there is discussion in the states around, you know, piloting programs of bringing students back, keeping them, um, quarantining them in safe mm -hmm. places, and just seeing if we can, if that can be done um, safely and without any sort of community spread. I think it's just so important that we uh, relinquish the fortress Australia optic for the rest of the world. And I think not only do international students bring money to universities, they bring huge amount of monies to communities. Um, and so I think they're yeah. just such an important part of the internationalisation of the sector and the strength of our Australian yeah. economy. Could I just come in? And that is a really significant issue for the city of Wollongong and our region. That is the injection of funds and resources that have come with international students to our city. Mm -hmm. And we've benefited greatly from that opportunity. It's created a... Uh, it's lifted the, lifted the ambience of our city. Uh, I think it's really injected a, an expectation of higher standard of all sorts of things, from mm -hmm. hospitality right through to education and the arts, as well as uh, the injection mm -hmm. into everyday activities and business and so on. But there is one thing that is extremely concerning to me, and that is, as a nation, we got addicted to it. And when it was cut off, we dramatically suffered. And that's the, that's the problem with, with us. We, we're, we're, we're now addicted to the pr high price of iron ore, for instance. But at the same time, I think we need to diversify the economy in such a way as making good use of the opportunities that international students have brought, as well as the opportunities to sell our raw our commodities, let's inject that into the economy to, be, economy to build up the standard of the uh, skills and the ability for us to value add. I'm over the idea that we just dig it out of the ground and export it without injecting into our, as we have done in our local economy, skills and opportunities. For instance, 
the steel industry here in Wollongong is successful because it not only produces steel, but it also value adds. And the implications of that for our city and diversifying our economy has been the mm. success of Wollongong and in contrast to other parts of the country. Professor Dave... <laughs> you can see why he won a mayoral election. Um, popular in the room. Pro yeah. Professor Davidson, you also had a, an experience, you've just returned from the United States, and you lived through the worst of what we saw in the US, and thankfully, as I said before, Australia has been spared the worst. What was it like being on the ground at that time? Well, I tell you, it was an experience that I would never want to endure again, I think, um, and something that I thought would never happen in the United States. Uh, but I think it shows the fragility of many of our health systems and the virulence of the virus. And um, can I tell you, I wouldn't, I've also become um, s even more passionate about science because if someone had said to me at the beginning of that pandemic, by the end of the year, you'll have a viable vaccine, I would have thought we're crazy. So mm. I think um, I, le I learned a lot about coordination and uh, delivery of care. And, 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 and delivery of vaccine. You, your background was in nursing. Nursing. And, and you're, you're involved in, in getting nursing. the vaccine out. Yes, yeah, so um, I was at Johns Hopkins University and we were a big part of, of delivering vaccines. The other thing that people don't are not really aware of, m most of the vaccine delivery in the United States was given by volunteers. Okay. Um, you know, because I, I think part of it was the emergency and just the, the need to move forward. So we would be going to basketball stadiums, going to communities, uh, trying to reduce barriers, particularly for at-risk populations. Um, so I think it's a, a lot about taking vaccines to people, making it less confusing in how to access, and also leveraging community leaders, um, particularly in um, uh, culturally diverse groups, to, to sort of empower individuals to have the vaccine. And I also think there was something about just everybody, you know, hundreds of people going, it sort of seemed to diminish some of the fear associated with the vaccine. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. Good, good luck in the, in the new position as well. Our next question comes from Michael Piella. Good evening. On Mabo Day, I would like to recognise the Wadi Wadi people of the Darwell Nation. This question... This question is on behalf of our school leaders, including our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander prefect. Recently, in our local community, we have started a petition calling for the government to act on the Uluru Statement from the Heart, calling for a voice to Parliament and a Makarata Commission. People within our community have shown great support for this issue, and as voters in the next election, we ask why the government refuses to take action on such a vital element of reconciliation considering that this year's theme of Reconciliation Week centres around action. Michael. Thank you for that question, Michael. As, as someone whose great-great-grandfather was a Darawal man, thank you as well for that, that acknowledgement. We have some Darawal people in the room with us as well. It's nice to see you here. Mm -hmm. I want to go to you first on this, Tim Wilson, because your journey's been interesting. On, on when it comes to recognition and, and recognition in the Constitution, trying to see how marry that to a conservative approach to politics as well. Tell us about that. I think you're confusing me with somebody else. I'm not a conservative, I'm a liberal. <laughs> um, and I say that very deliberately. Um, and uh, <laughs> I've always started from the position of trying to understand the challenges and the, the faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and the silence. I was very moved by... I think it was a quarterly essay a few years ago uh, written by Noel Pearson about mm. the concept of the elephant and the mouse mm. and um, what that meant. But then how do you move a discussion from um, what was proposed, that was then proposed as a pre-Uluru into something that was practical, what I call going through the liberal lens because it had been through the conservative lens about the architecture of mm. the constitution to what is the liberal lens which assesses um, how do we make a society whole and make everybody feel included um, and be full participants within our society. So uh, the challenge we have is making sure we have something 
that is going to be uh, put either to the parliament or the people that is going to pass because I don't think that there is any way that any of us would ever live, with, I think, with the scars that would come if it were put to be put to the, particularly to the people and were defeated. As uh, I lived through the debate on the legal definition of marriage um, and it was very challenging for a lot of people, um, but one of the reasons that some of us were so confident of a public process is because we knew we would win because the arguments would win. I think the work that hasn't been done on uh, the Uluru Statement or what's the practical derivative of that uh, hasn't been one to the same scale. And people will debate that, uh, but I think it's, we want to have a proper conversation so that it gets the outcome that people want. And yet on, on your own side of politics, we saw that the Uluru Statement from the Heart was rejected and we heard all of those claims at the time, which people have since walked back, that this was a third chamber or that somehow this was antithetical to liberalism, mm. that you can't recognise a distinct group of people in a society where we are individuals and not you can't recognise race in the Constitution. How did you square that, that issue? Well, well, that was never my view. Um, but it's uh, in the end, we've got to be a more complete nation at the end of whatever process is mapped out, where people feel that they're recognised, understood, and there are different parts of it. There's obviously the discussion around the voice to parliament, uh, and then there's also the Makarata Commission, which is the truth-telling commission, which um, can exist regardless of what happens with constitutional I'm not saying expense of, but regardless. And I actually support that mm. because I think if you're going to go through a process of healing, you have to have a start with acknowledging past and truths so that people can then walk on a journey together. And that, that in itself may be one of the bases in which you can then have a conversation about what follows. The concern that I have, and I've outlined already, is putting something to the people that's yeah. defeated. And I still have reservations about the consequences of putting something in the Constitution, whereas if it were to be legislated, I would be much more relaxed. Lisa jackson Pulver, um, as an Indigenous person as well, can you speak to the, the sense... We, we've been here so many times before, mm. haven't we? This question of recognising Indigenous people was, was put to, uh, to the people before. We've had various false starts when it comes to recognition or treaties. What is the sense, and I know you can't speak for the entire Indigenous population, no. but what is the sense amongst Indigenous people right now about where this process is at? Uh, in where I'm from, my world, it's very much around, can we just crack on with this? It's been 230 plus years, never ceded. <laughs> never ceded, never sold, no treaties. Um, People are asking, what do we need to do about Aboriginal people or Indigenous matters? A lot of people came together and has put an enormous amount of love and time and conversations and interrogated some very heavy questions and came up with this document, this recommendation that is probably one of the... Um, biggest endeavours of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across the land because of the multitude of voices that contribute to that. And then somehow that is still not enough. Mm. I don't know where the line of enough is. Let's go backwards. We had a royal commission. We've had black deaths in custody. We've had national inquiries. We've had the National Aboriginal Health Strategy. We've had these things over generations, over decades, over centuries. And then people come together and come up with a beautiful roadmap. It's superb, absolutely superb. You want to know what we need to do? We need to do that, without question. Stephen <laughs> Jones. Labor is committed to implementing the Uluru Statement, but at the same time there is a process already underway um, and, and a move perhaps towards a legislated voice for Indigenous people rather than a constitutionally enshrined voice to, to Indigenous people. Is that process going to get ahead of where the Labor Party is? We'll consider that when it comes before the Parliament. I want to start by thanking Michael and the, the students at my old school, actually, for um, the activism you've taken to this. And I see there's a bunch of school groups in. I see Mr Fitzy up there in his AIM T-shirt, which is great, from Dapto High, and a, a <laughs> bunch of different uh, schools here. I think the young people are way ahead of us old fogies on this, yeah, and I, I think that's really exciting. Um, with respect to Tim, and I actually think he's a person of goodwill on this particular issue, um, I think we get off on the wrong foot 
if we start seeing this through a liberal lens or a labour lens, I think we've got to see this through the lens of human decency and history <laughs> and... The and to borrow some words from Tony Abbott, who I actually thought put it very eloquently, this is unfinished business. Mm -hmm. We've got to get this done. Um, and my own party em embarked on it. We were very, very hot on the recognition stuff and we put a lot of energy and work into the recognition stuff. And then the Uluru process took off and that was quite challenging for us because we thought, well, we're going down this way. The mob are going in a different direction. We met with uh, the, the authors of the Uluru Statement at Uluru at the, on the final day of the ceremony. We said, well, actually, this is a better process and we've got to do it. And that's why we've signed up to it, because we think it's about decency, it's about getting it right, and it's not about yeah. talking to Aboriginal people, it's about listening. Could I, I, think also, I could I also... Just, just, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just a quick one. I think uh, Tim's on the right path in as much that the div challenge here is putting into referendums and trying to get a re change to the Constitution and those sorts of things. Uh, that is fraught. What we need in this country is a Bill of Rights. Mm. And that will highlight the fact that what we've done to the Aboriginal uh, and Torres Strait Islander people in this nation is recognised as absolutely horrific and wrong and then you've got some basis on which you can then argue for the change of the Constitution. The but the Bill of Rights is if, the place If we're going to start debating a Bill anyway, of Rights, Tim, we may be here all <laughs> night. <laughs> yes. Yes. But, but, but can I just clarify that? Stephen has completely mischaracterised what I was talking about. In fact, it go, you asked the question about and, and, my and, own journey. And, and, what and, I, and you were talking as a philosophical, philosophical liberal based. rather than a capital it's, L it's, liberal from I, the party. Because I agree with you. The, the basis of this is anchored in a sense of human dignity. Um, and always has been, but people can approach it from different ways based on... And if you want to take everybody on a journey, you have to start from understanding where people sit, mm. including Aboriginal, obviously Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, but the rest of the community to take and walk them on that journey. And people have different perspectives on how they get to the end road. I and would next, put uh, that you have to listen first. Correct. The voice must come first. Mm. Correct. Our next question comes from Sam Todorovic. Hi. Um, yeah, uh, Good evening, Steve. Uh, Stan, sorry, in the panel. <laughs> There's a Steve here. There's a yeah, Stan. Uh, just, just, my... just don't call someone Stephen Bradbury. We had that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is more directed at uh, Steve. Uh, do you think Labor's problems, uh, mainly in the past federal election, state and by recent by-election, stem from the fact that it has turned its back on blue-collar workers and the elderly? During the previous federal election, Labor basically told pensioners and retirees to get stuffed by wanting to steal their franking dividends and tax them. Uh, secondly, they seem to be siding with uh, other parties who are intent on closing mines, thus affecting blue-collar workers and also these regions who rely on such mines for their prosperity. And livelihood. And Stephen, I think after the last federal election and the recent state by-election in the Hunter, um, is that message being received? Thank you for your question. It gives, and uh, I want to start by saying no, I don't believe. I've, I grew up in this region. I literally grew up on the side of a coal mine um, with a lovely view of the steelworks. Um, I don't need to be uh, reminded about the importance uh, of our working class community and the people who live here and the need to ensure that we have good, decent jobs now I think, I think what we might future. be hearing, though, Stephen, but, uh, is, that, is that someone here is saying that he feels as if... Am I right in saying this? And that you feel as if the yeah. Labor Party is no longer speaking for working people. No, and I don't agree. I don't, respectfully, I don't agree, and I thank you for raising the question. I think, um, firstly, you, Stan, in your introduction, um, raised a couple of state election. We've never won the seat of Hunter. We've never won that You're seat, not in 100 up your chances years. in the, in the lead-up to this last one. Not in 100 years, and that was probably a mistake. We've never won the seat of Hunter in 100 years, so that's seen as the litmus test for how Labor is going in working-class communities. Frankly, it's a pretty silly test. Nobody says, for example, the Liberal Party is in crisis because they're down to two seats in the West Australian Parliament or they've last, lost the last two elections in Queensland on the trot. Federal elections run on federal issues. But you do raise a good point. 
And that is, how do we, on the one hand, look after the people who are working in heavy industry and in mining and know that this is probably the best job that they've had and they're going to have um, for, for their working lives, at the same time as being very honest mm. and saying, your grandkids probably aren't going to work in the mine. And uh, your grandkids I, probably can, aren't going to... Can I bring to... Diane in onto this as someone who's been involved in the sector as well? We are at this hinge point. We saw uh, the role that Adani played in the last federal election um, and how decisive Queensland was. How do you see this, this moment in terms of, particularly when it comes to industries such as mining and where Labor may sit? Well, I think people are looking for the jobs for the future, you know, and they want their employer to be involved in the conversation with them about the skills they should build. And I've, you know, very much on the record as saying that I do think it is an employer responsibility and that government should set in place the structures for skills development, education and so forth. But at the end of the day, the people who are employing you should know you quite well and know how to move your pathway forward. Um, so I think that's as relevant as how political parties are mm. sort of seeing their relationship with people out in the Can I, on, on and so Really forth. important point. Whenever workers that I grew up around and that I represent now hear people talk about jobs of the future, they hear that as code as you've given mm. up on the job that I've got mm. right now. And, so and I think it's absolutely Stephen's critical right. that mm. we are taking messages to people saying we've got your back. We want to look after your jobs. We want to look after and ensure that you're looked after at the same time as being very honest about a pathway, about where we're taking our region, our nation, our economy. Mm. Honesty, but also we've got to be dealing with people's mm. and legitimate anxieties. And, and this speaks to your, yes. to your concerns here, Gordon, doesn't yes. it? And, and, and particularly I think you've raised yes. this, how this message is received, that while there may be a transition from what some industries to others, how do you bring people with you, particularly in a region such as this? And from my perspective, and Stephen's on the right path there, in as much that, yes, there is a future and it doesn't involve fossil fuels or whatever, mining, but <laughs> how do we get people... How do we get people out of that mindset? They are frightened, OK? It's all right for us to protest and say we need to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. That's fine. And we need to work against, uh, against the... Uh, the, the forces that would want to continue to use fossil fuels. But if we're going to get people to come with us on this, we also have to create the opportunity to alleviate their fears and concerns about their future. And that's where governments need to be more proactive. It's called change management. And it has to be on a national level to get our minds around the fact that people are frightened. And we're in a period where anxiety... And such as in the situation with the COVID situation and uh, so on. And we've got all these so-called mental health workers out there and so on. That's fine, but we need to be conscious that change is happening so fast, people are so anxious and they're going to dig their heels in. So how do you work, that, uh, work around that? You need to work with them to provide a future and a sense that you've got their back. And Stephen is right. And so if we're going to go anywhere, let's work together to create a future for those who are, are employed in industries that we don't, don't, or don't want any longer. Tim Wilson, when we um, entered into this COVID crisis, um, maybe the Prime Minister said at the time, this is not a time for ideology. And it's, a, it's an interesting period of politics, isn't it, when you have a debate within Labor about reclaiming its heartland or being rejected by its heartland about the inner cities versus the regional areas. And on your side of politics that traditionally may have been about, you know, um, cut, cut down on, on deficits and smaller government, it's now having to spend <laughs> and, and a larger idea of government. It's raised some interesting sort of ideological questions this period, hasn't it? Well, the present moment is faced dealing with the challenge of the pandemic, and that's a, hopefully a temporary scenario. The bigger question is how we build the country out and post the pandemic period. Uh, and uh, the foundations in which it needs to be is based on respecting people and how they live their lives and creating the job opportunities for future generations. And the question that was asked before was ultimately one that was anchored very closely in respect and the challenges that particularly older Australians faced in the lead up to the last election where they were going to lose a third of their income overnight if there was a Labor government elected and every time anybody wanted to raise a criticism Can of I that, they were shut down um, by the Labor Party, just like Stephen's trying to do that with me now. And the reality <laughs> is that up. because they wouldn't listen, millions of Australians went into a ballot box and voted against them in an election they expected to win. 
So like, just like with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues and with other ones, the basis in which we should start every conversation is by listening and understanding the motivations and the anxieties because the comment made before was right. People are anxious about the future. They're anxious about the future in the sense of now associated with the pandemic. They're anxious about the future and the job opportunities of the future. But if you want to understand how to take people on that journey and work with them exactly as was said, it has to start from listening, engaging and working with them. And that includes the private sector, those who invest for the future, but, of course, those that want jobs for the future. Telling too. the truth is you a can... good part of that. That's and right. I had pensioners coming up to me who had never owned a share in their life saying, I'm going to lose something because of the campaign that you ran, running around telling lies okay, to people, well, saying they well, were going to lose something that they that, never that, had. That is a complete lie yourself. This is a lie that I tell. Exactly I dare you to put it on the table right now. And this okay. is why this we're is anxious. A, this, this is, is why the we're problem. Anxious. On, on this day, Stephen Jones, Jones it took us, it took us to get to the end of the program for the politics to really come out. We can save that conversation for behind the curtains. That's all we have time for for this evening. Please thank our panel, Gordon Bradbury, Diane Smith-Gander, Stephen Jones, Lisa jackson Porber, and Tim Wilson. And thank you as well for all of your questions this evening. Next week, well, we're still talking COVID, the COVID endgame. We're told the vaccine is our best form of protection, but is Australia being left behind? We're going to probe that question next week. Join us then. Have a good night.